Holcombe. Does he agree with me that keeping commercial routes into the UK open is critical and ensuring British nationals can continue to return home as these routes have a vital connection for many of my constituents who were struck abroad? Foreign Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank my honourable friend and also thank him for his tenacity and for raising the case of his constituents um, so swiftly. I'm delighted and, and of course, relieved uh, that they've been able to get home. Uh, and he's absolutely right with the broader point he, he makes. Yes, the charter flights are important. We've got over 30,000 British nationals back on those flights, but we have had to work very hard to keep the airports open, to keep particularly the transit hubs open. As a result of that, we've managed to secure the return safe and sound of uh, over 1.3 million UK nationals on those vital commercial flights. Staying in the North West, we've got to Chris Green. Chris Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thanks in part to our leadership in and working with international partners on the GAVI programmes. We're in a leading position to collaborate in developing and manufacturing vaccinations. Does my rival friend agree that we need to take the same collaborative approach to developing and, crucially, manufacturing a vaccine to tackle COVID-19? Foreign Secretary. Well, I thank my honourable friend. He's absolutely right. We're proud to be pioneering trials in this country to find crack the issue of finding a vaccine. Um, of course, the manufacturing base we've got here, we've got a, uh, an incredible pharmaceutical sector. We need to be leveraging that. And we're also proud internationally that we co-hosted the Coronavirus Global Response Initiative on the 4th of May. And we will be hosting uh, the Global Vaccine Summit on the 4th of June. As I said, in relation to CP and Gavi, we're the largest donor to the recent calls for funding. We'll continue up that uh, international collaboration, which is so vital. Go well, back across the shadow, Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. The UK's participation in the International Pledging Conference was extremely welcome, but it was deeply concerning that the USA was notable by its absence. Without US participation, the search for a vaccine will undeniably be slower and more lives lost. So can he reassure us that he or the Prime Minister did ask the United States to attend? What was the reason for turning us down? And what realistically does he think the UK can do to turn this situation around before not just the Gavi summit that he mentioned, but the Crunch G7 Leaders Summit in June? Foreign Secretary. Well, can I thank the Shadow Foreign Secretary? She raises an excellent point. This is a moment where we need to try and reduce uh, political tensions and work collaboratively uh, right across the world. In relation to returns, we, I work with my Cuban opposite number, my Chinese opposite numbers, and foreign ministers from around the world. And when it comes to finding the vaccine, I think there's an even stronger impetus. We'll keep making the case in the G7 bilaterally with the Americans, with uh, all the countries, the major countries, to try and get a real, really strong international leadership. And of course, we will continue to uh, try and make sure that's a, as broad and as deep a uh, coalition as possible. We're Tom Tugendhat. We're unable to connect. So what I'm going to do is call Minister James Dudridge to answer the substantive question tabled by Ruth Jones. Minister Dudridge. The humanitarian situation in Zimbabwe is bad. I had been an optimist on Zimbabwe post Mugabe, but things are bleak across the political, economic, social and humanitarian fronts. Her Majesty's Government stand ready to support, but only when we see genuine reform. Until then, we support the people of Zimbabwe with a £140 million development package, but crucially, none of this money goes directly through the Government of Zimbabwe. We go across to Ruth Jones. Ruth Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his update there. There are currently 7 million people in urban and rural areas of Zimbabwe in urgent need of humanitarian assistance, compared to only 5.5 million in August last year. So what conversations has the Minister had with the Zimbabwean government to discuss its humanitarian needs? Minister. Uh, on Thursday, I spoke to uh, the DFID uh, head in Zimbabwe and also our ambassador in relation to the situation. But they were very clear, as I am, that we need domestic reform in Zimbabwe as well as external uh, international development. I will now call Minister James Cleverley to answer the substantive question tabled by Robert Largham. Minister Cleverley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are concerned about Iran's destabilising regional activity. 
The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps provides military and financial support for groups that include the Houthis and Hezbollah. Support for these groups is in contravention to the UN Security Council resolutions and undermines prospects for regional stability. We have called upon Iran to play a constructive role in the region, and ministers and senior officials routinely raise concerns with Iranian counterparts and regional partners. Go across to Robert Lagan. Robert Lagan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Islamic Republican Guard Corps is the nexus of Iran's destabilizing activities, distributing funds and weapons in Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen. The Republican Guard is already sub subject to UK sanctions. So does the minister agree with me that full prescription should now be applied? And does he share my concerns that the expiration of the JCPOA arms embargo in October stands to enable the Republican Guard to expand its murderous regional actions? Minister. Uh, we have long expressed our deeply held concerns about the destabling uh, activity of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And whilst I take uh, into consideration the points that he's made about their activity, uh, the UK government does not routinely comment on organisations uh, which it uh, may prescribe, although the prescription list is regularly uh, uh, reviewed um, and we will always take um, the situations on the ground into consideration when we update the prescription list. We go substantive question, Minister, from Stephen Crow. Uh, with permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 17 and 18 together. Uh, we welcome the ongoing cooperation between Israel and the Palestinian Authority towards tackling COVID-19. Uh, a matter I was pleased to discuss directly with the Israeli ambassador to the UK and the Palestinian Prime Minister recently. UN agencies, the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority are working together to ensure essential medical supplies and staff reach the most, reach the most vulnerable areas, including Gaza. We encourage continued positive interaction between Israel and the Palestinian authorities in their efforts to fight COVID-19. Stephen Krabb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend will be aware that the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process recently praised the way that the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority have been working together to tackle COVID-19. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that this kind of practical cooperation, the building of trust and meeting shared challenges head on is the way that peace will get built in the region? And will he step up his efforts to encourage genuine negotiations based on the two-state solution. Minister. Um, in conversations I've had with both representatives of the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority, I have praised uh, the way that they have uh, worked together on this. Um, and I absolutely agree with him uh, that international cooperation is the way that we, we, we as uh, the international community, will fight this. Uh, as the Prime Minister said at the uh, Coronavirus Global Response International Pledging Conference that he co-hosted in May, um, the race for a vaccine is not a competition between countries, but the most urgent shared endeavour of our lifetime. And if the attitudes that we bring into fighting this uh, disease can be more broadly applied, I think the world would be indeed a better place. Go across to Steve McCabe in Birmingham. Steve McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his uh, comments. Will he join with me in welcoming the news that Israel has approved a $230 million advance payment to the Palestinian Authority alongside coronavirus test kits, intensive care beds, ventilators, drugs and protective equipment? Isn't that exactly the kind of behaviour we should welcome and encourage? Minister. Uh, I, uh, I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for the, uh, the points he's made, uh, and we have indeed um, commented positively to the Israeli government about the way that they have worked with the uh, Palestinian Authority, and indeed I have made the same point to the Palestinian Authority representatives in the way that they have worked with the Israeli government. It does indeed show a pattern of cooperation uh, which uh, should be uh, replicated, uh, and indeed I hope is a step towards building trust that will enable uh, a sustainable, peaceful solution 
to uh, the situation in Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Speed up the answers, Minister, please. We now go across and welcome Wayne David in his new position. Wayne David. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As has been said, there is encouraging cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians with regard to COVID-19. I'm sure the Minister would agree with me, but this highlights how wrong it is of a new Israeli government to pursue a policy of illegal annexation of large parts of the West Bank. But my question is, what is the government doing to mobilise international opinion against this inter annexation? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. May I uh, welcome uh, the honourable gentleman to uh, his place, though it is virtual. Um, the, the UK government has expressed uh, both publicly and indeed to the Government of Israel, its uh, concerns about reports of uh, annexation, uh, which uh, we have uh, consistently said we uh, oppose and could be detrimental to the chances of a peaceful, sustainable two-state solution, which is something that I think we should all be working towards. We we'll go across to Tommy Shepherd, Minister. We've got, sorry, a substantive Tommy Shepherd. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And with your permission, I will answer questions 20 and 21 together. The, the UK is deeply concerned about the reports that the new Israeli government coalition uh, has reached an agreement that may pave the way for annexation of parts of the West Bank. Uh, any unilateral move towards annexation of parts of the West Bank by Israel would be damaging to efforts to restart the peace process, contradictory to international law and might make the chances of a sustainable two-state solution hard, harder. We recently made clear our concerns at the UN Security Council remote meeting to the Middle East peace process on the 23rd of April. We have Thomas Shepherd audio late. We go up to Thomas Shepherd. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I appreciate the uh, Minister's concern, uh, but can I ask him, does he believe that the proposed annexation by Israel of the Palestinian territories would be illegal under international law. And if he does believe that, does he think the United Kingdom government's response should be the same as it would be with other countries guilty of illegal annexation, such as Russia? Minister. Um, our long-standing position is that uh, such a move would be contrary uh, to uh, international law. We continue to have a constructive relationship both with the Government of Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and we will continue to work towards a peaceful resolution that takes us to a sustainable two-state solution. That is our long-standing position and one that we continue to work towards. We now go over to Yorkshire with Clive Betts. Clive Betts. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm pleased to hear the Minister is uh, condemning any proposed annexation uh, of territories in the West Bank by the Israeli government. But will he go further and accept that such an annexation would render any future Palestinian state uh, unviable, uh, it would destroy its uh, geographical integrity, and as such, it would actually render a two-state solution obsolete. So isn't it absolutely essential the government acts now with others to stop the Israelis annexing territory in the way that they are currently intending? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, as I said, our position, our long-standing position is that we do not support uh, the annexation of parts of the West Bank, and as I've already said, uh, doing so could make uh, a sustainable two-state solution harder. We support actions by the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority that take us closer to a sustainable two-state solution, and we express our concerns about anything which might put that at risk. I will now call Minister Nigel Adams to answer the substantive question tabled by Alistair Carmichael. Minister Nigel Adams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There have been a number of concerning recent developments uh, in Hong Kong, and as co-signatory of the joint declaration, the UK expects the mainland Chinese authorities to respect Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and the rights and freedoms provided in that legally binding treaty. We're monitoring the situation very closely and, and will provide a full assessment of implementation of the joint declaration in six monthly reports to Parliament. We go across to Alistair Carmichael. Alistair Carmichael. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Beijing's top political office in Hong Kong recently referred to pro-democracy protesters as being a political virus and declared itself as being entitled to interfere in Hong Kong as it sees fit. Clear breaches of the joint declaration. So can the minister tell the House what plan does the government have to help BNO passport holders in Hong Kong should this deterioration of relations continue? I now go across to Minister Nigel Adams to answer the question. Minister Nigel Adams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Foreign Secretary commented uh, in Parliament on the 26th, to sem on the 26th of September that um, the status of British nationals overseas was a part of the delicate balance in the negotiations that led to the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Um, we believe it would undermine the commitments we made under the memorandum exchange in connection with the Joint Declaration to change the arrangements regarding the status regarding BNOs. Um, but of course, we keep, this, keep the situation monitored constantly and um, I know the Honourable Gentleman takes a very keen interest in this particular issue. That concludes that part of the event. Before calling the Prime Minister to like to make a statement, I should like to make this statement of my own accord. I am aware of the widespread concerns across the House about delays in government departments and the Department of Health and Social Care in particular, responding to written questions and correspondence. I have received representations on this matter from the Procedure Committee, from backbenches across the House, from opposition parties. Last Wednesday, the Leader of the House argued that the degree of latitude is allowable for the Department. However, the Secretary of State himself has referred repeatedly to the value of parliamentary scrutiny and written questions and letters to Ministers are integral to such scrutiny. I accept that the Department of Health and Social Care faces many challenges. But I am sure resources across Whitehall can be mobilised to support them in maintaining proper standards of accountability. While I think it is right for me to call for improvements within government, I also want to make a plea to all honourable members to be targeted and considered in their written questions that they table at this time, and to avoid swapping departments with questions on fast-moving situations, which will be superseded before they can be answered. I now call the Prime Minister, who should speak for no more than 10 minutes. Prime Minister. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, I will make a statement about the next steps in our battle against coronavirus and how we can, with the utmost caution, gradually begin to rebuild our economy and reopen our society. For the last two months, the British people have faced a grave threat with common sense, compassion and unflinching resolve. We have together observed the toughest restrictions on our freedoms in memory changing our way of life on a scale unimaginable only months ago. All our efforts have been directed towards protecting our NHS and saving lives. Tragically, many families have lost loved ones before their time, and we share their grief. Yet our shared effort has adverted a still worse catastrophe, one that could have overwhelmed the NHS and claimed half a million lives. Every day, Dedicated doctors, nurses and social care workers, army medics and more have risked their own lives in the service of others. And they have helped to cut the reproduction rate from between 2.6 and 2.8 in April to between 0.5 and 0.9 today. The number of COVID patients in hospital has fallen by over a third since Easter Sunday. Our armed forces joined the NHS to build new hospitals on timetables that were telescoped from years to weeks almost doubling the number of critical care beds and ensuring that since the end of March, at least a third have always been available. Our challenge now is to find a way forward that preserves our hard-won gains while easing the burden of the lockdown. And I will be candid with the House. This is a supremely difficult balance to strike. There could be no greater mistake than to jeopardise everything we've striven to achieve by proceeding too far and too fast. We will be driven not by hope or economic revival as an end in itself, but by data and science and public health. And so the Government is today submitting to the House a plan which is conditional and dependent, as always, on the common sense and observance of the British people and on continual reassessment of the data. 
That picture varies across the regions and home nations of the United Kingdom, requiring a flexible response. Different parts of the UK may need to stay in full lockdown longer, but any divergence should only be short term. Because as Prime Minister of the UK, I am in no doubt that we must defeat this threat and face the challenge of recovery together. Our progress will depend on meeting five essential tests. Protecting the NHS, reducing both the daily death toll and the infection rate in a sustained way, ensuring that testing and PPE can meet future demand, which is a, a global problem, but one that we must fix, and avoiding a second peak that would overwhelm the NHS. A new UK-wide joint biosecurity centre will measure our progress with a five-stage COVID, COVID alert system, and the combined effect of our measures so far has been to prevent us from reaching level five, a situation that would have been in which the NHS would have been overwhelmed, and to hold us at level four. Thanks to the hard work and sacrifice of the British people uh, by following the social distancing rules, we're now in a position where we can move in stages uh, to where I hope the scientific advice will tell us that we are down to level three. But this will only happen if everyone continues to play their part, to stay alert and to follow the rules. We must also deal with the epidemic in care homes where a tragic number of the elderly and vulnerable have been lost. And uh, while the situation is thankfully improving, there is a vast amount more to be done. And of course, we need a world leading system for testing and tracking and tracing victims and their, their contacts. So I'm delighted that Baroness Harding, the Chair of NHS Improvement, has agreed to take charge of a programme that will ultimately enable us to test hundreds of thousands of people every day. All this means that we have begun our descent from the peak of the epidemic, but our journey has reached the most uh, perilous moment where a wrong move could be disastrous. So at this stage, we can go no further than to announce the first careful modification of our measures. Step one in moving towards COVID alert level three, a shift in emphasis that we can begin this week. Anyone who cannot work from home should be actively encouraged uh, to go to work and sectors that are allowed to be open should indeed be open, but subject, subject to social distancing. These include food production, construction, manufacturing, logistics, distribution, scientific research. And to support this, uh, to explain this again, we're publishing guidance for businesses on how to make these workplaces safe, COVID secure. People who are able to work from home, as we've continually said, should do so. People who cannot work from home should talk to their employers about returning this week and uh, the, uh, the difficulties that they may or may not have. Anyone with COVID symptoms, obviously, or in a household where someone else has symptoms should self-isolate. We want everyone travelling to work to be safe, so people should continue to avoid public transport wherever possible, because we must maintain social distancing, which will inevitably limit capacity. Instead, people should drive or better still walk or, uh, or cycle. With more activity outside our homes, we would now advise people to wear a cloth face covering in enclosed spaces where social distancing is not always possible. And you're more likely to come in contact with people you don't normally meet. The reason is face coverings can help to protect each other and reduce the spread of the disease, particularly if you have coronavirus-like symptoms. But this does not mean, I must stress this, this does not mean wearing medical face masks, uh, 2R or FFP3, which must be reserved for people who need them. We have all lived so far with onerous restrictions, Mr Speaker, on outdoor spaces and exercise. Yeah. And this is 
Uh, and this is where uh, I, 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 my uh, on, on, right honourable friend interjects from the centre because I know he is a keen swimmer, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, we can't do anything for swimming pools, but we, we can do something for lakes and the sea. This is where we can go significantly uh, further, uh, and because the, there is a lower risk out from out, uh, outdoors than indoors. So from Wednesday, there will be no limits on the frequency of outdoor exercise people can take. Uh, you can now walk, sit and rest in parks. You can play sports and exercise and you can do all these things with members of your household, uh, your own household, or with one other person from another household provided you observe social distancing and remain two metres apart. And I do hope that's clear, uh, Mr Speaker, and I'm, I'm conscious people want to come back and ask questions of, uh, uh, in more detail, and I'd be very happy uh, to answer. We shall increase the fines for the small minority who uh, break the rules, starting at £100, but doubling with each infringement uh, up to £3,600. Uh, you can drive as far as you like to reach an outdoor space, space subject to the same rules and the laws and guidance of the devolved administrations. Uh, I'm sorry to say, however, Mr Speaker, that we shall continue to ask those who are clinically vulnerable, including pregnant women and people over 70, or those with pre-existing chronic conditions, to take particular care to minimise contact with those outside their households and we must continue to shield people who are extremely vulnerable. They should, I'm afraid, remain at home and avoid any direct contact with others. I know that uh, easing restrictions for the many will only increase the anguish of those who must remain shielded. So the government will look at every possible way of supporting the most vulnerable. Mr Speaker, all of our precautions will count for little if our country is reinfected from overseas, so I give notice that we shall introduce new restrictions at the UK border, requiring 14 days of self-isolation for international arrivals, while respecting our common travel area with Ireland. Every day we shall monitor our progress, and if we stay on the downward slope and the R remains below 1, then, and only then, will it become safe to go further and move to the second step. This will not happen until the 1st of June at the earliest, but we may then be in a position to start the phased reopening of shops, to return children to early years settings, including nurseries and childminders, to return primary schools to school in stages, giving priority to the youngest children in reception and years one and year one, and those in year six preparing for secondary school and to enable secondary school pupils facing exams next year to get at least some time with their teachers. I, our ambition, and I stress this is conditional, Mr Speaker, is for all primary school pupils to return to the classroom for a month before the summer break. To those ends, we are publishing guidance on how schools might reopen safely. Step two could also include allowing cultural and sporting events behind closed doors uh, for broadcasts, which I think would provide a much needed boost to national <laughs> morale. But nothing can substitute, Mr Speaker, for human contact, and so the Government has asked SAGE when and how we could safely allow people to expand their household group to include one other household on a strictly reciprocal basis. Finally, Ms. No, no earlier than July, and I, Mr Speaker, I'm conscious that you wanted me to, rhyme, to, to wind up, and I may say... I say ten minutes, and I, you've I, gone I, over it. I understand that. Well, perhaps, Mr Speaker, would it be in order if I requested that my interrogation could continue for, for a little bit longer in order, in order for me to make all these points? Uh, no, no earlier than July we may be able to move to step three if and only if supported by the data and the best scientific advice. We would then open, uh, aim, to, aim, to reopen, aim to reopen some remaining businesses, including potentially hospitality, cinemas and hairdressers, as well as places of worship and leisure facilities. And this will depend on maintaining social distancing and new ways of providing services. So uh, we will phase and pilot any reopenings to ensure public safety. And I must be clear again, if the data goes the wrong way, if the alert level begins to rise, we will have no hesitation in putting on the brakes, delaying or reintroducing measures locally, regionally or nationally. Mr Speaker, our struggle against this virus has placed our country under the kind of strain that will be remembered for generations. 
but so too has the response of the British people. So too will the response of the British people, from dedicated shop workers keeping our supermarkets open and ingenious teachers finding new ways of inspiring their pupils, to the kindness of millions who have checked on their neighbours, delivered food for the elderly or raised astonishing amounts for charity. In these and in so many other ways, we are seeing the indomitable spirit of Britain. And, Mr Speaker, let me me summarise by saying that people should stay alert by working from home if you possibly can, by limiting contact with others, by keeping your distance to two metres apart where possible, washing uh, uh, washing your hands regularly, and if you or anyone in your household has symptoms, you all need to to self-isolate. Because if everyone stays alert and follows the rules, we can control the virus, keep the rate of infection down and keep the number of infections down. And that is how we will be able, Mr Speaker, to save lives and to save livelihoods as we begin to recover from the coronavirus and I commend this statement to the House. What, what, what I'd like to say is uh, to the Leader of the Opposition, please take an extra minute after that. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer, six minutes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for advance copy of his statement and for advance copy of the command paper that his um, office sent through um, uh, an hour or so ago, and, and for taking time to speak to me and other opposition leaders um, yesterday before his speech. And can I start by acknowledging just how difficult the decisions are that now fall to be taken? We do recognise how difficult they are. What the country needs at this time is clarity and reassurance. And at the moment, both are in pretty short supply. And at the heart of the problem, it seems, is that the Prime Minister made a statement last night before the plan was written or at least finalised. And that has caused considerable confusion. So yesterday afternoon, there was a number 10 press release that said from Monday, i.e. today, anyone who can't work from home, for instance those in construction and manufacturing, should be actively encouraged to go to work. So it's understood from that that it was today was the start day and that was for construction and manufacturing. A few hours later the Prime Minister made his statement there was no express reference to time frame. Today, in the command document, page 25, It says that these policy changes apply from Wednesday, and the list has been expanded from construction and manufacturing to other sectors. So now we have a start date of Wednesday and a wider range of sectors that are going back to work on Wednesday. So far, so good. One of the key issues, then, is will there be guidelines in place to ensure safety at the workforce? They were being consulted on last Sunday. They were vague and had big gaps in. So under protective equipment, it just said to be inserted or to be added. In the document I've now seen, it says that workplaces should follow the COVID secure guidelines, which I assume are the same guidelines, as soon as practicable. But under page 22, it says they will be released later this week. So we know we're going, some people are going back to work on Wednesday. The guidelines have not been published. They're apparently going to be released later this week. So can I just ask the Prime Minister, will the guidelines, the safety guidelines, be ready for Wednesday? which realistically means tomorrow, if workplaces are going to be ready for them for Wednesday morning. If not, is he seriously asking people to go back to work without the guidelines? Have the guidelines now been agreed with businesses and trade unions? That was the attempt that was going on Sunday week ago. And do the guidelines only apply in England? Can I then turn to getting to work? Because this has been the other issue of some concern. The Prime Minister said last night that that people shouldn't rely on public transport. The command paper now, page 26, says the government is working with transport providers to bring services back to pre-COVID-19 levels as soon as possible. So bring the services back to their old levels and says social distancing guidelines on public transport must then be rigorously followed. So ramp up the service, new guidelines for social distancing. But again, we learn from page 26, unfortunately, those guidelines are not ready. And they're coming later in the week. Well, are they coming tomorrow, ready for Wednesday? or later in the week, because otherwise people will be using public transport, operators required to operate to guidelines that don't yet exist. And again, is that for England only? And have those guidelines been agreed with the transport providers and the relevant trade unions? Mr Speaker, one other point about work. There is a real concern that the Prime Minister might be able to 
Tariff 5 for those that have got childcare responsibilities, with schools not going back till June, and I understand the conditionality behind that. Should they go back to work on Wednesday or not, because they're in a quandary as to what to do? Can I then turn to international travel? Last night, the Prime Minister said in his speech that he was proposing to impose quarantine on people coming into the country by air. Well, given that 100,000 people have arrived uh, in the UK since the start of lockdown, why is that only being introduced now? And is it only for those arriving by air? Because the command paper now says it's for all international arrivals. So does that mean all ports? And again, is that England or the UK? But it then goes on to say, these international travel measures, i.e. the quarantine, will not come into force on Wednesday, unlike the other policy changes, but will be introduced as soon as possible. So when is that going to be? The Prime Minister also said we're going to be driven by the science, the data and public health. So what is the scientific evidence and the public health basis behind the measures announced and the stay alert message? Uh, and, and finally, uh, the Prime Minister will know that there's not consensus, either on messaging now or on policy, between the UK Government and those in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Not something I know he wanted to see, but now we're in that position. Raises serious concerns with a real danger of divergence. And again, um, this is clear from the document that he uh, provided to me an hour or so ago. Page 27 says, travel to outdoor spaces is now permitted irrespective of distance, but we must respect the different rules in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Does that mean one can travel to the border but not presumably beyond the border where there are differences, uh, which makes enforcement extremely difficult and clarity really difficult. So what can we do, what can he do, to ensure that we exit lockdown as one united kingdom just as we entered it? Mr Speaker, there are lots of questions, but so far, precious few answers. The country does need clarity on this, and re people need reassurance above all else. They need it in the next 48 hours. So can the Prime Minister now uh, please provide that uh, clarity? Well, thank, you Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And uh, I'm grateful for all the questions that the Right Honourable Gentleman has raised and, uh, and the, the spirit in which he's raised them. And, and let's be absolutely clear, uh, the, what we're trying to do now, I think he's, he was, was good enough to refer to himself, we're moving from a situation in which the, uh, the people of this country have had the overwhelming impression that there's a very clear and simple piece of advice, Mr Speaker, that we all have to obey, which is, broadly speaking, stay at home. And the people in this country have, by and large, followed that advice uh, in perhaps more uh, emphatically, more, more uh, thoroughly than many other populations around the world. Uh, but thanks to their efforts, what's happened is that we've got the uh, disease. We made huge progress, Mr. Speaker, in fighting the disease. We've got the the R down, and we need now uh, to begin, as it were, to acknowledge the progress that has been made and to take the small, limited steps that we can with the R down where it is. And that's what the government is, is trying uh, to do. And clearly, when you're, when you're coming out of a, a message that is so gloriously simple as stay at home, there will inevitably uh, be complexities that he's, that he's rightly uh, alluded to. Let me, let me try and deal with some of the, the issues that he, that he raised. Uh, what we're saying now is that uh, you should stay at home if you can, but go to work if you, if you must, if your job doesn't allow you uh, to go to work. And plainly, he, he raised uh, properly the issue of people who don't have the right childcare, uh, Mr Speaker, and, and we, will, we will count on uh, employers to be, uh, to be reasonable. Uh, they, if people can't go to work because they can't get the childcare that they need, then plainly they are impeded from going uh, to work, and, and they must be uh, defended and protected on that, on that basis. If their kids can't yet go to, to school because the schools aren't back, then uh, plainly they can't uh, go to work. And I think people uh, with co common sense, businesses, employers with common sense, uh, do understand that. I think it's incumbent on all of us to get, that, uh, to get that message across. But I think one thing that was perhaps missing from his analysis, Mr Speaker, was the simple fact that over the last... Uh, couple of months, actually plenty of businesses from construction to manufacturing, office businesses of all kinds, actually have been proceeding and they have been 
uh, working. And they've been doing so in a way that uh, respects social distancing that is as COVID uh, compliant as possible. And so to answer his specific questions about uh, the timescale for the publications of our, of our guidelines, we will be publishing uh, the guidelines on uh, in places of employment uh, today, tonight, transport uh, will be out uh, tomorrow. And uh, we're being very, very consistent in what we've said throughout uh, this period. For, at the very beginning, uh, we said that uh, you should stay at home if you can, go to work if you must. What's changed now is the emphasis and the encouragement that we're giving to people, uh, as it were, to follow the initial guidance uh, the initial guidance of March the, uh, the 23rd, I think it was. He asks, uh, Mr Speaker, about uh, the, uh, what science it's going to be, to be based on and, and, and how uh, we've, we've reached the conclusions that, that we have. Uh, as I said last night, as I, as I, as I told the House, the, the R, the reproduction rate of the disease, is now between 0.5 and, and 0.9. It varies across the country, as he rightly says, and that's why actually... Uh, uh, different approaches by the devolved administrations uh, are, are to be welcomed where those are appropriate to their specific needs. But overall, and I think that all uh, leaders of the devolved administrations would confirm this, there is a very, very strong desire to move forward as four nations together. And perhaps I can, I can sum up, and we all share, uh, we all share uh, the strong view that you should stay at home if you can. That remains the position. So the steps we're taking today are modest steps, entirely governed by the science. Uh, we hope, we hope that we may be in a position, and this is entirely conditional, to take further further steps in. Forgive me, Mr. Speaker. F further steps in the uh, in the next few weeks. He asks an entirely given the complexity of what's being said, and he raises a, a perfectly reasonable point about uh, people moving across the border into to Wales for recreational purposes. Or, uh, I, I totally un and, and, and believe me, there will be myriad other uh, hypothetical situations which people uh, will be able uh, to raise. But, but let's be absolutely clear, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, I think everybody, everybody understands what we are trying to do together. And that is, that is working together as a country to obey the social distancing rules, which everybody understands. And I think what the British people understand is that this is the moment for the whole country to come together and to obey those rules and to apply their common sense in the application of those rules. And I have huge admiration for the way that the police have uh, enforced them so far. And I know that the British public is going to continue to help uh, the police and everybody uh, to enforce those rules, to get our reproduction rate down, to get this disease uh, even further under control by continuing to apply good, solid British common sense. It's worked throughout phase one, and I've no doubt that it's going to work in the second phase of the disease as well, of, of the fight against the disease as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I firstly thank the Prime Minister for the tremendous leadership of our nation during these times and also for his comprehensive statement today. But would he please outline his post-Brexit and post-Covid economic plan to set our UK economy back on the right track in the coming decade? And does he agree with me that our priority must be to make plans now to boost domestic output in manufacturing and agriculture? so that we can re reduce our reliance on imports and support British business growth and job creation in constituencies like Romford, with a bold free enterprise agenda led, I believe, by a Prime Minister who I know will show, will show the true bulldog spirit of this country and take our nation back to prosperity and greater things in the future. Well, I, I thank my honourable friend very much, and uh, I, I, can, I can assure him that the, that the spirit of, uh, of Romford will certainly be, uh, be uh, actuating our, our, our approach. And I can, I can tell him that actually there's a huge difference between the way this government has handled uh, this crisis 
and what happened in 2008. Huge difference. The most important, of course, is that uh, we decided to look after the livelihoods and the job prospects of the, of the uh, families across the country. Uh, and we looked after people uh, who are on low pay, on modest incomes, in retail and hospitality with our job, uh, coronavirus job protection scheme, with the furloughing scheme. And uh, we are going to ensure that this economy comes back strongly, uh, Mr Speaker, and will be uniting and levelling up across the entirety of the country. We now go to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is obvious that the last 24 hours has spread confusion. What the public desperately needs today is to be given some clarity. Mr Speaker, lives are at risk, so political judgments and verdicts on this weekend's chaos will have to wait for another day. I respect the right of the Prime Minister to make his judgments on his scientific advice. I hope he is right in the determinations he is making, and that, crucially, if evidence suggests an increase in the R rate, that he is prepared to act accordingly. Mr Speaker, we need to be guided by one clear understanding, and that is that mixed messaging risks lives. In order to urgently re-establish clarity, I want to ask the Prime Minister five specific questions, and I would genuinely urge him to provide five clear answers. So for clarity, will the Prime Minister confirm that he accepts and respects that in the devolved nations the advice clearly remains? Stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. And that it is the legal right of all the First Ministers to set their approach for Scotland, for Wales and for Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, in terms of the new slogan, last night the Prime Minister said, and I quote, I have consulted across the political spectrum across all four nations of the United Kingdom. Can the Prime Minister therefore explain why his government didn't share his new slogan with the devolved administrations, leading them to learn of the change in the Sunday newspapers? Further to that, will the Prime Minister commit not to deploy this new slogan in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland unless the devolved governments decide otherwise? On quarantining following travel, when will these quarantine measures come into force? And can the Prime Minister confirm if his own Transport Secretary has told airline industry leaders that if there are too many obstacles in implementing it, it may not even happen. And final, finally, for ultimate clarity, will the Prime Minister reaffirm for the public and businesses in Scotland that the advice that they should follow will come directly from the Scottish Government and not the advice that he gave in last night's broadcast? Minister. Uh, Miss, Mr Speaker, I think, uh, in, in, in just quickly, the answers are uh, one, yes, two, I think stay alert is a, a, a valid uh, piece of advice, and indeed so is stay at home if, if you can. Uh, my answer quite number four is no, and uh, Mr Speaker, I would just say to the uh, right honourable gentleman uh, quite simply that I do think that the, the UK has been able, thanks to the cooperation I've had, uh, not just with uh, honourable members opposite, but across all four nations, I think we have been able to make a, a huge amount of progress together. I think most people actually understand uh, where we are in uh, fighting this disease. Uh, most people looking at the, uh, the reality, the practical reality of the advice that we are uh, giving today uh, can see that overall uh, there is far, far more that unites uh, the UK uh, than divides it, though I know that it is always the political temptation uh, to accentuate uh, the divisions. That is not going to be the approach uh, of this government, and I don't believe it should be the approach that commends itself to parties across this House. Can I just urge members to speed up in the questions and certainly in the replies from the Prime Minister? I now go across to Kevin Hollinray. Kevin Hollinray. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's statement and his approach to start to reopen the economy while keeping the virus under control? Testing and tracing is key to the way forward. Uh, would my right old friend agree that a way, if we can reduce the time taken to get test results back from the current five days to as little as 24 hours, would make that approach even more effective? 
<laughs> Absolutely, my honourable friend is completely right, and speed of turnaround is is crucial in uh, in dealing in, in improving our our testing. We have done a hundred thousand tests uh, uh, again uh, yesterday. I'm <coughs> I'm pleased to say, but uh, clearly uh, turnaround pace of turnaround is absolutely critical for getting up to where we need to be two hundred thousand, as he knows, uh, by the end of the month, and then a much more ambitious programme thereafter. Go across to Sir Edward Davy. Sir Edward Davy. Throughout this crisis, many of us have put party politics aside to support the national effort to defeat coronavirus. And we want to keep doing that, not least because the British people have sacrificed so much already. Yet in return, the government must be clear with the British people and reassure us that ministers are following the science and the advice of independent experts. So will he confirm new reports that neither the chief medical officer nor the chief scientific advisor signed off yesterday's shift in the public health message from stay at home to stay alert. Uh, uh, Speaker, that's, uh, that's not right. We go across to Mike Wood. Mike Wood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many businesses restarting operations are unlikely to have order books full enough to sustain a full workforce for months after the end of formal restrictions. Will the Prime Minister look at how job support can be tapered rather than being withdrawn overnight and more flexibility added, like being able to re furlough for a week at a time to reflect a firm's workforce needs? Sure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I do think that uh, the furloughing scheme has been uh, a, a one of the most remarkable features of the government's uh, response, and it is unlike anything seen uh, internationally. Uh, six and a half million people currently are being. Uh, supported. It is absolutely right that we should do it. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, anticipate what to my right honourable friend uh, the Chancellor is going to say, but you'll, the House will hear more about that, Mr. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow. We we'll go across to Liv Savile Roberts in Marion. Liv Savile Roberts. Yeah, I understand the sense of optimism the Prime Minister wishes to convey, and I understand that people need hope. But we must not forget that over 31,000 people are dead. To the hundreds of thousands of grieving families, this doesn't feel like victory in a fight. Mr Speaker, there is now a three nations approach. Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland all agree on policy and message. And I mean this with no malice, but for the sake of clarity, can he confirm that in almost everything he has announced today, the Prime Minister is acting as the Prime Minister of England? Prime Minister. No, no, Mr Speaker, I reject that completely, and I think that most people looking at, uh, at what we're saying will know that it carries, uh, it is a very good advice for the entire population of the United Kingdom, though I perfectly respect uh, the inflections and variations uh, that may be necessary uh, both locally, uh, regionally and nationally to reflect uh, differences in those areas. There is a higher R rate in some parts of the country, and as we, as we come out of the disease, Mr Speaker, we will be, far, we will be applying different measures in different places in order to get that R down uh, locally, regionally and nationally as well. Go across to Alicia Kearns. Alicia Kearns. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me in thanking everyone who has saved lives by following government guidance over the last seven weeks? But constituents of Rutland and Melton have written to me about the few persistent offenders who continue to flout the rules. Will my right honourable friend confirm how great the increase in the fines will be and that this will act as a greater deterrent and serve to make clear that the danger from the virus has not yet passed? Mr. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, I can confirm uh, that the, the, the starting point of the fines will be uh, £100, will be low, lowered to £50 pounds if paid within uh, 14 days, uh, that, but it will go up and up and up to, uh, as I said earlier, on to £3,600. We don't want to impose these fines. Nobody wants to impose these fines. We don't want to add to the burdens of our, our wonderful police uh, force. Uh, so that's why uh, I hope that I know that the British people will exercise their common sense, Mr. Speaker. Go we'll across to Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for his statement. Can the Prime Minister ensure the House that the government will carefully manage the economy off the job retention scheme so as there is no cliff edge for the sectors that he has mentioned? He has already mentioned hospitality and tourism. In Northern Ireland, that's 16,000 people potentially face redundancy in another month's time. That has to be carefully managed. And will he protect? Northern Ireland airports from unfair competition in the Republic of Ireland. 
Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we've made a, a substantial provision for the protection of airports and other large businesses uh, with, uh, with loans that uh, the, the government has made available. And I can certainly assure him again uh, that the question was asked earlier about the, the furloughing scheme. Uh, the House will hear more uh, about that from uh, the Chancellor. And I ha have no desire to, to steal his thunder on that, Mr Speaker. But let me t I, can, I can certainly tell, uh, th tell uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, what I think he would accept. That it has been one of the, uh, the, the most salient, the most important features of this country's response uh, so far to this crisis that we have looked after, that we have looked after uh, the, uh, the, the lowest paid, some of the lowest paid people in our society, the, the, work, the hardest working people, and we will continue to do so. We go on down to Henry Smith. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A recent Centre for Cities report stated that the Crawley economy could be the worst affected anywhere in the United Kingdom because of the significance of the aviation industry. Can the Prime Minister say a little bit more about what support uh, will be offered by the government for this crucial sector, not just to my local constituency, uh, but also for the whole UK as a global island trading nation. Minister. I thank my honourable friend, and he's raised this with me personally on uh, several, several occasions. Aviation is crucial for our country and for our economy. Uh, the packages already available include a Bank of England schemes for firms to raise capital business, uh, interruption loan guarantee schemes, uh, the time to pay flexibilities with, with tax bills. Uh, we will do everything we can uh, to make sure that we, uh, that we keep Britain flying and, and get Britain uh, flying again in the way that it needs to and get airports flourishing in the way that they need to. But first, as I'm sure he will understand, Mr Speaker, we must devote our energies as a nation to beating this virus. Go up to Chiamara. Chiamara. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The North East has the highest coronavirus infection rate in the country and some of the highest levels of deprivation where coronavirus mortality is twice that in the least deprived areas. Now the Prime Minister is telling those who cannot work from home, so mainly in lower paid manual and people facing jobs, to get back to work without transport, childcare, PPE or proper protections for workers in place, putting more risk on those already at risk. So will he say clearly that first and foremost, everyone has a duty and a right to stay safe? Yes or no? Prime Minister. Uh, absolutely, Mr Speaker. And I just remind of what I said to the right hon. Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition earlier on. Don't forget that many businesses uh, have kept going uh, throughout this crisis in, uh, across many sectors, uh, but we are going to insist that uh, businesses across this country look after their workers, are COVID secure, COVID compliant. The health and safety uh, executive will be enforcing it and we will be having uh, spot inspections to make sure that businesses are, uh, are keeping their employees safe. And it will of course be open uh, to employees who do not feel safe to raise that, not just with their employers, but with the HSC, with the health and safety, safety executive as well, Mr Speaker. We go to Michael Fabricant, Michael Fabricant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all know it'll take a while yet, but eventually the UK will be free of COVID-19. When that does happen, what is my right honourable friend's vision? Does he want to see a return to the old normal of pollution and crowded commuter trains? Or does he see a better and cleaner future? Mr. Okay, well, uh, out, of the, out of this tragedy and out of this disaster, uh, uh, of course, uh, we hope that some uh, changes and some opportunities will come. And I certainly see a huge opportunity uh, for cleaner, greener transport. The UK will continue uh, its mission to be a net zero nation by 2050. We know we can, uh, we know we can do it. And, uh, the, and as, as the House will know, uh, we've committed £2 billion, Mr Speaker, to investing in cleaner transport, uh, walking, cycling, uh, amongst them. We go over to Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister recognise that the COVID crisis has exposed grotesque levels of inequality within our society? And his statement yesterday has given a carte blanche to many employers to try and force people to come back to work without proper consideration of their health and safety, without consideration of the dangers that they're going to suffer in travelling to work. And does he not recognise 
that his statement, whilst the death rate is so high and the reinfection rate continues, will actually probably make the situation worse, not better. Will he reconsider very, very carefully and not lift the restrictions and not lift the lockdown until it's absolutely clear that we do have corona crisis under control rather than affecting, as it is, the poorest and most vulnerable people in our society the worst. And his statement, I believe, will make the inequalities in this country even worse at the centre of this crisis. Prime Minister. Uh, well, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I must say I reject that characterisation of what we're, we're doing. We're, we are effectively restating the, the position of, of March the, the 23rd, but with a change of emphasis uh, to make it clear that those who uh, cannot work from home in, in sectors such as construction and manufacturing uh, should go uh, to work, uh, provided that work is going to be COVID compliant, COVID secure. He's right to raise that vital issue of safety, provided the transport to get those workers there is COVID secure and COVID compliant. We're publishing uh, papers today and tomorrow about how we propose to do that. It is a small step forward, uh, but I believe it's the right step forward. The country has made huge exertions to bring the R down, Mr Speaker, and made huge exertions to get uh, this virus under control. It's right now that we should make some small steps forward. We go over to South Yorkshire, Alex to Alexander Stafford. Alexander. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I first thank the Prime Minister for his clear statement and for support and guidance he has given us all across Wilder Valley. It is clear that this government is taking a balanced and pragmatic approach that ultimately will save lives. However, can the Prime Minister confirm that this plan is both dynamic and flexible enough to ensure that we can reopen up different businesses at different times and in different locations so that we can kickstart our economy as soon as we are able to, as only with a strong economy can we have a strong NHS? Mr. Uh, my honourable friend is entirely right to, uh, and I congratulate him, by the way, on the, on the, the birth of his daughter Persephone, uh, perhaps appropriate uh, for a country that is beginning to take steps out uh, from uh, the darkness, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we, we will, uh, as we do that, as we take these, as we take these steps, we will, we will, of course, be flexible. As I said in my answer just now to the right honourable uh, gentleman from, uh, from Islington, uh, we will make sure that where there are local uh, flare-ups, where uh, we see the disease uh, taking off again, we will not hesitate to put on uh, the brakes. Uh, but he's absolutely right that to have a, a strong NHS, as we must and we do and we will, uh, we need a strong economy as well. We're going up to Scotland to Drew Hendry. Drew Hendry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, reports in the press say that his government are preparing to cut the rate of support in the furlough scheme by a quarter. Can you assure us that this is not the case and that his advice for people to return to work is not an excuse to re reduce spending uh, over public health? I have, a, I have a considerable respect for the, uh, for the press, uh, but uh, I, I would advise him not to necessarily to, uh, to believe everything that he reads about that matter until uh, he's heard uh, from uh, the Chancellor, who, as I say, will be uh, speaking to the, to the House tomorrow uh, about it. Going down to Warrington South, Andy Carter, Andy Carter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's statement and recognise the maximum caution he is taking in gradually lifting these restrictions? Um, I've heard today from many constituents here in Warrington who are parents of school-aged children. They're keen to return to work this week in a safe way, but will need some help with looking after their families while schools remain closed. Can the Prime Minister outline what guidance government are giving to parents to help them with childcare? Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, he raises a very, very important point, which I've, uh, which I've addressed earlier a couple of times. And I, I want to stress again for the benefit of the House, the, you know, for the country, we want to, if we can, we want to bring uh, primary schools uh, back at the beginning of next month, uh, reception year one and year six, and then, and then to have uh, all uh, primary school children getting at, at least a month of, of education before the holidays in, in July. I appreciate that uh, as that, that's going to be a, a process in which not everybody will be able to uh, get their kids into school as fast perhaps as they, uh, as they would in order to get, but they would like in order to get back to work. There will be uh, childcare needs. My, my right honourable friend, the 
uh, Secretary of State for Education will be setting out in further detail how we propose to help those with particular childcare needs. But I want to stress that if you can't get the childcare you need uh, to, to get to work, then that is plainly an impediment on your ability to work, and your employer should recognise that. We go to Catherine McKinnell. Catherine McKinnell. Thank you. Prime Minister, hundreds are dying every day and we still don't have sufficient testing and tracing to measure and control the spread of infection. Yet the government is starting to relax lockdown in a haphazard and confusing manner. He continues to claim his strategy is a success, despite us having the highest death toll in Europe. So is it the government's position that as long as the NHS can cope, it's less important how many catch this virus and sadly die? Mr Speaker, I, I, I must reject what she said about uh, re relaxing lockdown. We're, we're not ending uh, the, the lockdown. Uh, we have to be very, very clear with people that uh, the measures remain in place. Uh, what we're saying is that uh, they should look at, ex at the uh, precise uh, guidance that was given, and that is that if they uh, must go to work, if, they, if their job means that they must go to work, then they should be actively encouraged uh, to go to work, and we're setting out steps uh, to allow them to do so. And the, uh, the, the other important change that we're making this week uh, relates to uh, people's ability to exercise. Uh, as we go forward, we will be governed uh, in the next two steps, whether on June the 1st or, or the beginning of July, will be governed entirely uh, by the science. And indeed, I, we will continue to work uh, with uh, opposition parties and uh, across all four nations uh, as we go forward, Mr Speaker. Go across to Martin Vickers. Martin Vickers. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I fully support the cautious approach outlined by my right honourable friend. He will be aware that many small businesses in Cleethorpes and other seaside resorts uh, face uh, considerable problems such as guest houses, uh, bars and restaurants, and they are going to need continuing support. What assurance can he, he give that that will be forthcoming? Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, as somebody who's, who's enjoyed the wonderful hospitality sector in his, uh, in his constituency uh, on, on, on a couple of occasions, at least I know how important it is and how vibrant it is. And I, I would just remind him of what has been achieved so far to support the, the hospitality sector with the uh, coronavirus job retention scheme, the, the furloughing scheme. I think it has been uh, very, very important. Uh, the bounce back loans uh, so far, I think, uh, have paid out. Uh, loaned 50, uh, sorry, £5 billion pounds, uh, already, and uh, uh, I, I don't want to anticipate what, as I say, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, will say about uh, the, the furloughing scheme, but the House should expect, as I've said several times, uh, more very shortly. 19 withdrawn, so we go to Mary Robinson in Cheadle. Mary Robinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Greater Manchester, whilst the curve is flattening, it, it is not clearly on a downward path with an R rate which could be as high as 0.9. In view of this, what message would my right honourable friend give to my constituents in terms of their alertness on the five-tier scale? And does he agree that for city regions such as Greater Manchester, a significant increase in testing and contact tracing is vital in controlling this virus as we begin to ease the restrictions? Um, well, uh, my honourable friend is entirely right, and that's why we're recruiting 18,000 uh, trackers, uh, tracers, by, uh, the, uh, by the 18th of, the, of this month. Uh, and they will conduct a huge operation, Mr Speaker, to, to trace anybody who's been in contact with somebody who tests positive for the virus, which is, of course, why it's so vital, as she rightly says, to have a massive uh, testing operation that is being hugely scaled up, as I've told the House today. Yesterday, we achieved uh, 100,000 uh, tests. We're going to go up to 200,000 thousand by the end of the month and uh, testing, uh, tracking and tracing will be absolutely integral to our, uh, our ability uh, finally to defeat this virus. Go across to Karen Burke. Karen Burke. Thank you Mr Speaker. If there is to be a return to employment it is absolutely dependent upon safe public transport. As I understand the roadmap face coverings are to be advisory and the wearing of them will not be enforced. Can I ask the Prime Minister for a one word answer? Should, indeed must, everybody travelling on London buses and tubes wear face covering? Yes or no? Prime Minister. 
I, I think she said should or indeed must, and there, there, there are two. Um, uh, we're certainly not compelling people uh, to, to wear uh, f face coverings, but plainly uh, they can be of, be of benefit uh, to, uh, to others primarily because they stop the, uh, the aerosol transmission of, of droplets which may uh, contain uh, infection. So uh, we can help each other, as I said in my uh, introductory re remarks, Mr Speaker, if we do wear cloth uh, face coverings in confined spaces such as transport where you're going to come across people uh, that you, you don't normally, you're not normally in contact with uh, or, in, uh, or in shops, uh, we think that it is advisable uh, to wear uh, such cloth face coverings. Go we'll across to Dr Luke Evans. Dr Luke Evans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Page 30 under step two, it says opening non-essential retail won't happen before the 1st of June. So what will my right honourable friend do to make sure the banks expedite the applications for both the bounce back loan and the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, which provide vital cash to ensure that both small and medium-sized businesses can survive through. Prime Minister. I, I thank my honourable friend for that, uh, that question, and I perhaps anticipated it by, by pointing out that the bounce back scheme of 50, 000, loans of 50,000 uh, has already paid out uh, 5 billion, and I'm, I'm given to understand that actually some businesses that have applied for the bounce back loan have, have got the cash in their accounts on the same day. Go to Glasgow to Chris Stevens. Chris Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I hope the Prime Minister will join me in thanking the civil service, particularly employees in HMRC and DWP who are processing payments. They deserve a reward. So will the Prime Minister follow the lead of the Scottish Government uh, and have a, an interim above inflation pay settlement and place a moratorium on job cuts and office closures? Mr Speaker, I'm not going to make any commitments now from the dispatch box on, on, on future pay settlements, but what I can say is that I am uh, I lost in admiration of the efforts of uh, our uh, civil servants, whether in, in DWP, HMRC, even in the, in, in the Treasury. If you think about the, the furloughing scheme, everybody said it was impossible, everybody said it was far too complicated, you'd never get that cash into, into people's pockets, but Mr Speaker, they did it within four weeks, and I think it's a fantastic tribute to the work of our civil service, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart. Go across to Robert Courts. Robert Courts. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for his update on progress uh, of testing and tracing this invisible killer. But can he confirm for the people of West Oxfordshire that the new systems that we are putting in place will, in the fullness of time, be able to detect local flare-ups? Yes, indeed, Mr Speaker, and the, the intention is that the, the COVID alert system in time will be sufficiently sensitive and, uh, and flexible as to detect local uh, flare-ups so that, for instance, if uh, a, 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 uh, the COVID is detected in the water supply of a certain town, or, or, or well, then, then steps can be taken, or in a school uh, in, 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 in an area, then steps can be taken on the spot to deal with that flare-up. Measures can be taken uh, to keep the R down locally as well as nationally. Go to Ruth Jones. Ruth Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister claims to have devised a new stage of his plan, having consulted across all four nations of the UK. Yet the First Minister of Scotland claims the first she saw of it was in the newspapers. The First Minister of Wales says the UK government only engages in fits and starts, whilst the First Minister of Northern Ireland is sticking to the original stay-home message. The devolution does exist, and we have it here across the UK. So can the Prime Minister please explain what on earth is going on? Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I think any uh, impartial view of what the UK is doing will see there is much more uh, that unites our approach than divides it. Though, I, As I say, I note that, uh, of course, it, it, it might seem attractive sometimes to accentuate the divisions. We fully respect and understand uh, the necessity uh, where there are different uh, rates of infection, the necessity sometimes to take a, a different approach. But I can also say to the Honourable Lady that there has been intensive uh, communication and very good communication uh, between uh, this government and all the devolved administrations uh, throughout this period, and that will continue. 26 is withdrawn, so we go across to Kate Green. Kate Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
no one should be expected to take up or return to a job that isn't safe. So can the Prime Minister confirm that there is no intention of changing the relaxation of rules on benefits conditionality? Doing so could pressure people to attend unsafe and risky workplaces. Okay, I, I, of course, Mr Speaker, nobody should be penalised for doing the right thing and helping this whole country to uh, defeat this virus. We now go across to Rubber Halford. Rubber Halford. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, close to 90% of vulnerable children are not in education. Uh, will my right honourable friend support a catch-up premium alongside a national education volunteer force of graduate charities and retired teachers to provide tuition and pastoral care to these left-behind pupils? Prime Minister. I, I thank my uh, right honourable friend for what he uh, does to campaign for, uh, for vulnerable children and for education generally. I, I'm, we're looking at an Education Endowment Foundation, uh, uh, working with the Education Endowment Foundation and other partners uh, to see what we can do to support uh, the most disadvantaged uh, vulnerable children. Now, he will know, that, of course, under the existing uh, measures, Mr Speaker, vulnerable children can now uh, go to schools. I want to thank all the teachers who are currently teaching them as they're teaching at least some of the, the children of key workers. Go across to James Murray. James Murray. Mr Speaker, Paravale, Greenford and Northolk tube stations in my constituency have twice the London average of construction workers living nearby. Although their employers may have been asked to consider staggering start and finish times to reduce pressure on public transport, the business minister confirmed to me this is not mandated by government guidance. To keep my constituents and others safe, Will the Prime Minister now instruct site managers to stagger their operating times and have the government take responsibility for making sure this happens? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And we will, of course, be issuing our guidance on COVID-secure uh, workplaces, as I've said uh, several times already. We're also working with Transport for London, a body that he and I the, the, the know uh, well, uh, to ensure that people on TfL are, are kept safe, that uh, we have social distancing on the tube. And, of course, people will instinctively say that's going to be uh, very, very difficult. Yes, it is going to be uh, very difficult. It will mean very substantial reduction in capacity, Mr Speaker, but we must do it to make it work, to make sure that uh, the Honourable Gentleman's constituents can get safely to work. Go across to Faye Jones. Faye Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful that the Prime Minister is working closely with the Welsh Government to design a Four Nations approach to ending the coronavirus lockdown. This is so important for my constituents in Brecon and Radnorshire who share a border with England. But would he agree with me that while the R number continues to vary across the country, restrictions in Wales remain the same and the changes he announced last night are not a green light for tourism or for people to travel to their second homes in Wales? Minister. Absolutely, Mr Speaker, and uh, this, I'm, I'm grateful. This is why it's so important that we should try and get as much, uh, as much clarity as possible. But I hope that the House does understand that when you're making changes uh, of this complexity, the messaging is, is, is crucial, but it is also difficult, and she's completely right. Uh, we don't want to see people, let me repeat, we don't want to see people travelling uh, to uh, another home for a, for a holiday uh, or to a second home. That is not what this is about. This is about allowing people uh, the pleasure and the exercise of going to places, uh, to parks, to places, uh, to national parks, places of outstanding uh, beauty and, uh, and taking advantage of, of the open air. Lawrence Robertson going across to Lawrence Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just a few days ago, uh, my father, Jim, died of coronavirus in hospital, but he didn't catch the virus in the community. He caught it in the hospital when he went in for another illness. As the Prime Minister quite rightly tries to reduce the spreading of the virus in communities and care homes, but we will also do whatever we can do to try to stop the spreading of the virus in hospitals. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm so sorry to uh, hear about my honourable friend's uh, father, and I, I'm sure the whole House joins with me in extending him our sincerest uh, condolences. And... The point that he makes about care homes is also, I'm afraid, a very, very important one. And uh, 
it, it will be no consolation to those who have lost uh, friends and relatives in, in care homes during the current epidemic, but the numbers are very substantially coming down uh, now. Uh, the numbers of, of deaths in care homes are very substantially coming down. But where he is totally right is that we cannot make progress as a nation on the steps that we have outlined, the further steps that we have outlined, step two, step three, uh, unless we crack these twin epidemics both in care homes and in the NHS. And I've been very clear with that both last night and today in the House, and I hope that the House uh, understands that. We go across to Daisy Cooper. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has set out five tests that uh, underpin the alert system, but there is one big problem. Whilst the government has told us how many pieces of PPE they've procured, how many tests they've undertaken and how many temporary hospital beds they've created, to date it hasn't once told members or the public how those numbers compare to what we actually need. So will the Prime Minister report to the House openly and regularly on both sets of data, what we have and what we need, and also set out how those metrics will inform his decision? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, thank you for getting on my feet faster. Um, the the, uh, the honourable lady raises a very, very important point. Uh, I will try to uh, give the House uh, more details of what we are doing, but I can tell her that so far, in spite of all the difficulties that I know people have experienced with, uh, with PPE, uh, it is the case that we've had no uh, national stockouts on or, uh, or uh, abs absolute shortages of any item of, of PPE, and we're, and we're continuing to turn the situation round and to get billions uh, of items to where they need uh, to go. We go across to Sir Edward Lee. Sir Edward Lee. The phased approach of the government uh, to protect public safety is obviously correct, but we are now faced with perhaps the biggest recession in hundreds of years and an unparalleled increase in the public sector. So will the Prime Minister ensure that, whereas in the past these increases have often been accompanied by waste and fraud and incompetence at the expense of the taxpayer, he will put the most effective public accounts controls in to protect the taxpayer and to pay for all this. He will ensure that we get Britain back to work and where it's possible to have social distancing, people are actually encouraged to work. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and uh, of course we will have effective accounting of, of the uh, investments that we're making to protect the public. Uh, the, uh, and of the furloughing scheme and all the many other expenditures uh, we are obliged uh, to make. But he, I think he would also understand that the biggest single economic risk we face at the moment is the risk that the virus should uh, surge back again and trigger a second spike. And that's why we all need uh, to work together, as I'm sure everybody understands, to de continue to depress the R, keep the virus under control and stay alert. Go across to Maria Riedel. Maria Riedel. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government originally said the government would fund councils for whatever they needed to get communities through the COVID crisis, but now says it will only fund the things government have specifically asked them to do. Now, Liverpool City Council and Knowsley Borough Council have both received less than half of what they've spent so far, despite having one of the worst outbreaks in the country and already having lost two thirds of their government funding in the last 10 years. So will the Prime Minister now undertake to reimburse them the full costs of COVID as promised at the start of this outbreak? Prime Minister. Speaker, as, as, as the Right Honourable Lady knows, we have invested uh, the 3.2 billion extra into uh, supporting local councils. I will take away what she said about Liverpool City Council and Knowsley Council. And I will take it up uh, with my Right Honourable Friend, the Secretary uh, for Communities and, and Local Government. 36 withdrawn. We go across to Chris Law. Chris Law. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government said yesterday that stay alert will mean stay alert by staying home as much as possible. However, this morning, the Prime Minister's Deputy, the Foreign Secretary, has said that people can travel as far as they want for exercise and can meet with other people in public places if they use some common sense. So can the Prime Minister tell me what stay alert actually means and where is the common sense and no longer keeping our families and communities safe by staying at home protecting the NHS and saving lives. Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I think uh, it'd be perfectly obvious to the, to the House what we're, we're trying to do and what we're saying by, by stay alert. What we're now saying is uh, we're re-emphasising or emphasising the importance of those who cannot work from home uh, going uh, to work, provided their workplaces are COVID secure, provided uh, that they, they observe the rules on of social distancing on, on public transport or, or however, however they go to work. That is what staying alert means. It's going to be absolutely vital. Staying alert is going to be absolutely vital to our continued success in beating this virus. I think the British public understands exactly what we're trying to do, uh, Mr Speaker, and I know that they can rise again to this challenge. Go across to Jane Hunt. Jane Hunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Loughborough University is responsible for producing some of our very best athletes and engineers. Unfortunately, their training and studies have been disrupted. The university is campus-based with all facilities on site. They would now like to bring back some student athletes to train and their engineers to attend concentrated lab work sessions, all while maintaining social distancing on campus and isolation from the wider community. Will the Prime Minister therefore work with universities to help them provide students with access to vital facilities to enable them to safely continue with their studies and training? Prime Minister. Uh, the, 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 the short answer is yes, Mr Speaker. I, I know Loughborough University well. It's an outstanding uh, university and uh, I thank her for championing it and we will work with Loughborough and across the sector uh, to see what we can do uh, in the way that she describes whilst maintaining social distancing and, and we can do it. Go across to Bill Esterson. Bill Esterson. People are worried about going back to work, about their safety and about infecting their loved ones. They don't understand why guidelines weren't published before they were told to go back to work. The Prime Minister's ambiguity and lack of clarity has just made matters worse. So will he take on board the concerns voiced by unions, workers and employers Will he tell us how he will enforce those guidelines to keep people safe? And will he say how workers will be able to voice their concerns about their safety at work? Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, this country has made huge progress in the last uh, two months. Thanks to our collective efforts, we've got the R down below one. Now is the time uh, to make uh, sm small, calibrated changes, uh, respectful always of the science and of the risk of a second spike. And that's why we're emphasising that if you uh, must go to work, if you can't work from home, then uh, you should do provided. Now, he's right to draw attention to this, provided your workplace is COVID secure. And we're publishing uh, further guidance on that and provided you observe the rules on social distancing. It's common sense. I do think the British people understand what we're trying to do. And I think they also understand that this is the right time, Mr Speaker, to begin those modest steps. Now comes the final question from Peter Aldous. Peter Aldous. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is right to highlight, above all else, the need to avoid a second spike. And a concern that I am receiving, both from individual constituents and from businesses, is that the reopening of primary schools could present a significant threat both in the classroom and at the school gate. Can the Prime Minister assure the House that he and his government will do all that they can to address these worries before allowing primary schools to reopen? Mr Speaker, and uh, I, should just, I, should, I should stress that we've only made the announcement on uh, primary schools as we say everything because uh, we, we have the, the guidance from uh, our scientists and our medical uh, officers and uh, we think that uh, we could get to that stage on June the 1st. But I want to stress to him that it is all, as I said to the House, it's all conditional, it's all provisional. We must continue uh, to drive down the R. We must continue uh, our fight against the, uh, the coronavirus and we will be publishing guidance, uh, Mr Speaker, about safety in schools, about uh, how uh, parents, uh, teachers and children uh, can use schools, can go to schools uh, with, with confidence, Mr Speaker. There will be change, the environment will be different in, in, in our school settings, uh, but that doesn't mean that they should be closed down forever. We will be gradually, if we can make progress, we will be gradually restarting, as I say, in June. Uh, order, order. I suspend the House for 30 minutes till 11 minutes past five. Order, order.